Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Waiting for everyone to join in and notify everyone that we're live. Hi. It's always, it's always so nice to see everybody pop in. I'm just gonna wave at everyone while they come in. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, hello. I always don't know what to do with myself in these first, this first minute of having everyone join in. So I'm gonna let everyone come in. We're going to pause this. Music is fire, yes, thank you, thank you. We are blessed, aren't we? All right, so we're gonna get started. So first of all, thank you all so much for, for coming and joining in. This is the first live on Savoring the Indo-Caribbean. And um, we've been having so much fun just posting photos about food and sharing more insights about Indo-Caribbean food and nutrition. So it's been just so amazing to keep in touch with you all uh, on this platform. Some of you may know me from um, Conscious Womaning, um, maybe from work that I do, Merge Projects, um, project management and leadership and it's just been such a pleasure uh, to connect with the community the indo-caribbean community and today specifically i'll be joined by three beautiful ladies tiara saira and savita who will be joining me for us to discuss two times removed in case you have not picked this book up i mean it was a whole trend it was a whole trend and we we have to thank all of you for doing that um Tiara is the curator um, and also has a story in here, uh, Savita, who will be joining us as well, and Sarah and myself. We all contributed to this book and it was one of the first times many of us had picked up a book and saw our names as authors, saw, saw um, characters that are, were struggling with the same things that we were, had the same names as we do. Um, so it was just such an honor to be a part of this. and. Just to give a little bit of a brief um, summary, we'll have Tiara on here as well, so she'll, she'll give us more insights into the process. But Two Times Removed uh, brings together a curated collection of 16 short stories written by a new generation of Indo-Caribbean storytellers. For many of us who have been raised outside of our home countries, our identity is a delicate balance of Indian roots, Caribbean heritage, and North American upbringing. So together, these uh, writers explore adolescence, relationships, trauma, family, identity, and more, um, bring to life the experiences of the modern day Indo-Caribbean. So all these stories are so amazing. And while I have um, Tiara, Saira, and Savita um, join in, I actually also wanted to read a quick, the quick intro because honestly, when I first picked this book up, um, we were all anticipating it, of course, and the intro actually gave me some chills. So I just wanted to read it to everyone. So it says, two times removed. We are two times removed. For Indo-Caribbeans, our story is one that begins almost 200 years ago when hundreds of thousands of Indian men and women made the bold and brave decision to begin a new life in the, Carib in the world, the Caribbean. Our ancestors traversed the dark waters they call what they call the Kalipani, and found themselves in the islands of Trinidad, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and many more. There was the be this was the beginning of a new era, one that encompassed this Kalipani identity, this new Caribbean identity, and the Indian identity we began with. These indentured Indians had big dreams. They they wanted to achieve more, do more, create a world they previously hadn't had access to. They didn't know it at the time, but they were creating a history and culture that would later develop into what we call Indo-Caribbean culture. The food they made in the barracks after long days on the plantation, the songs they sang in gatherings and on the ships, their language and dress, all of which they did their best to pass down. It was their resilience and sacrifice that paved the way for the stories we get to tell today. It was because of them that this book got to exist. So, so beautiful. And so I'm going to have my fellow, um, I'm gonna try to do this. How do I do it? Um, 
I'm going to grab Tiara, I'm going to grab Sarah, and I'm going to grab Savita. And while they join, hi Tiara! <laughs> hi! So good to see you! Savita, hey! Oh, loving, loving this. Hi Sarah! Hey! So good to see you guys. How are you guys doing? Oh, it is a hot day out there. It is. It's, it's like raining here. If, if you're in Toronto, it's just like, it's just not, it's not cute, but we're going to turn it around and this will be the case. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank you guys all so much for joining. I really, really appreciate it. And I think this is a great conversation for us to have. Um, I think I'll go with starting to introduce Karyla and the story that I wrote, which is really a story of three generations. So it starts off first with um, the former generation. So my parents coming to Canada. Then of course the main plot is our generation. And then it goes into our gener the generation uh, after us. And so of course the main plot um, is premised around some of the, some of the very real um, challenges that we have as Indo-Caribbean uh, women and self-identified uh, Indo-Caribbean individuals, and the the latter part of it was um, so, something that was so precious to me, which was, and I was thinking about, is how do we preserve our all of the things that are so amazing about Indo-Caribbean uh, Indo -Caribbean identity? So one of the so in the book, um, the main character passes down a recipe book of all these amazing um, uh, Indo-Caribbean cuisine and recipes. And of course, that's a beautiful way to represent culture, right? Of course, we want to pass this down. And it's that is premised on a real thing that I did, which is I started writing down these recipes. But also, it's what people don't know, it was also really symbolic for me. It was also the way in which I actually navigated Indo Caribbean identity. And in the book, one of the recipes, um, Salisha's daughter doesn't know, she doesn't know Karyla. Um, Salisha, she, she doesn't like Corella, so she never cooked it in her house. And so when her daughter opened the book and saw Corella, she was curious about what Corella is. And so really, the recipe book is a, a, a encompassing of Indo Indo Caribbean identity um, in that that uh, in, in reflection of the recipes and those which I love and I preserve, and some of which you know I struggled with personally and. Um, I don't really, I don't really have it as part of my day to day, and I don't really identify with it. And so it was really this this symbolic representation or metaphor of how I reconciled Indo-Caribbean identity. So, so to start things off, I'm wondering from any of you, whoever wants to jump in first, do you do you relate to this in any way? Is this something you you personally went through? Would be my first question. The second one is. How do you, like, where are you in your process of claiming or reclaiming Indo-Caribbean identity? Hmm. <laughs> I think I need a second to think about that one. <laughs> that was a tough one. I hit, you, I hit you real hard from the beginning. You did. Because you, I don't know, I feel like there's, like, always so many layers to, like, like, questions about that and, like, identity and stuff like that. So I want to just... Like, I want I want to say like I think for me um, I really struggled with my identity in high school and I didn't start seeing people who looked like me until I went to high school and then and then I was told to talk to Sonia when I got to Ryerson <laughs> in my first year and join Wiza <laughs> Um, and then I saw so many other people who looked like me, but I still felt like I was constantly like growing up. I was constantly called a coconut because of where I grew up and who I grew up around. Um, I want to say my journey really, really began in a, probably like in 2018 when I lost my dad. Um, I, I, I read Cooley Woman. And I think like that book like opened up my eyes to like, oh my goodness. Like even like, I know, I don't know if you took this classic um, intro to the Caribbean at uh, X University. Like I took it, but I still like, I felt like it, it didn't speak to me as an Indo-Caribbean. Um, and so I was like, oh, like this happened, but 
but I like I wasn't very interested then until as I got older I was like oh, okay so that's when I went on my journey to like understanding self and like finding immigration passes etc still want to go to Guyana one day figure that out but um I feel like I'm still figuring it out like I know one thing I really wanted like when I had a son I wanted him to be raised on all the foods that I was raised on so I made all of his food so I made doll with like curry powder in it <laughs> no no salt and pepper but like I made like Caribbean baby food um because I wanted him to like our food I made pumpkin with no spice and the boy his favorite food right now is you ask him doll rice and curry chicken with a side of roti and he's five <laughs> so I feel like I'm still on my journey <laughs> love that love that and I I I actually remembered as you were talking, Sarah, that I really did, I actually didn't introduce you guys properly. So I'm actually going to do mm -hmm. that now. Mm -hmm. And um, just as a backstory, Sarah and I, we went to X University or Ryerson University. So we were part of uh, the West Indian Student Association. So we actually go go back a little bit. And it was a uh, it was um, wonderful, Sarah, to see you <laughs> as a contributor to this. So I'm going to backtrack and I'm going to share a, uh, a bio of each of the ladies here. So Syrah, who uh, just shared her bio, she's a contributor of Dear Divya, wonderful story. And Syrah locates herself as, uh, locates herself as a brown Indo-Caribbean Canadian, cisgender woman of Indo-Caribbean, South Asian, Indian descent, and first generation settler in Takaranto, Toronto, Ontario, situated on the territory of in, in the shabby in this <laughs> sagas of the new credit um, with recognition to the dish with one spoon, one pound, and I should have read this before, and Treaty 13. Sarah's <laughs> family were Im immigrants escaping violence and oppression in Guyana and Trinidad. While this isn't important uh, for her to recognize this um, with you is because understanding colonialism and our history starts here. Starts in the conversations we have and the notion that we will we will not continue to reproduce the history that destroyed many indi indigenous families. Sarah is a child and youth care worker, as well as a mom, wife, daughter, sister, and friend. Sarah is passionate about bringing the history of Indo-Caribbeans to the newest diaspora of young people. She hopes to educate young people with her words and inspire them to continue their journey of understanding self in this world. So beautiful. So Dear Divya is about that, is, is in here. And Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your story specifically? I feel, like, I feel like Dear Divya, like so many people can relate to Dear Divya, like no matter what, um, like what background, like if you're from that era, because <laughs> I, I write from like an early 2000s era, I feel like that in that area, that era was like forgotten. Like it happened and then it's like, okay, bye. Like because <laughs> technology happened so quickly right like we went from like discman to mp3 players to ipods <laughs> like it just happened so so quick um and then like msn does anyone remember msn yeah yep. <laughs> yes <laughs> that's a whole scene yeah msn was a thing and then it disappeared within like a year like I'm like, I was like trying to remember the other day, like when I, when was the last day I went on MSN? Like, what was that last moment? What was my last <laughs> conversation with someone? Um, because then I got, I got a Blackberry and then Blackberry Messenger took over, right? Anyhow, I dig her. Um, I just feel like Dare Divya is really about self-exploration and, and like, I, I'm just so excited for people to read it because you can, like, there's so many characters that people, different people can connect to with it. So um, she's a young person exploring self. There's boys, there's a sister, there's this mysterious Dear Divya. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it's about. I, I won't give it. it. <laughs> and it really did take me back, Syrah. It really did take me back to <laughs> days and like when our I, I, it was I don't know if I did but I know many we like our our MSN names was like Kuliel two 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 and one two three. <laughs> <laughs> so you know big up 
big up MSN, bring in, bring in space, the Kuli identity. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to come back to everything that you said around, um, you know, preserving and some of the topics around being, a, being called a coconut. Before I do, before we do that, I'm going to read Savita's um, intro and Savita, it, uh, her story is neither here nor there. Beautiful story. Um, and Savita Prasad was, <laughs> <laughs> I was remembering when I spelled, so backstory, I have to say this. So I spelled um, initially Savita's last name as Parsad. So obviously I was thinking about Parsad when I wrote this. So, but Savita's, Savita's name is Savita Prasad, uh, was born and raised in the borough of Queens in the state of New York. Growing up, she realized the Indo-Caribbean West Indian culture is a unique category that has not been defined yet and is at the risk of extinction. As a kid, she loved asking members of the older generation questions and listening to the stories they had to offer. After graduating from uh, CUNY Hunter College with a bachelor's degree in on biological sciences and psychology, she is currently pursuing the field of medicine to achieve the larger goal of taking care of people in her community. An advocate for representation and gender equality, social justice concerns are also close to her heart. She's a skincare junkie and has recently taken an interest in products for curly hair. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, zip lining, taking naps, and Netflixing. Yeah, I'm very. Amazing. So, Savita, I really related to your story as well. And I'm sure you're going to touch on that as we get closer into the conversation. But anything else you want to tell us more about yourself and tell us a little bit about your story? So my story is all about self-identification. You know, we constantly get those surveys and we have to check off a box that represents where we're from, our race and our ethnicity. A lot of us are confused. And, we, and my character, she's 18 years old. She's sitting there and she's like, I'm not really Indian, but I'm not really, like I am, but I'm not. And everyone can relate to that at one point. So it's just like, it's a thing where, are we Asian or are we not? And she's just constantly like reflecting on these experiences that she's had, this relationship she's had with this boy that broke her heart. And he says that, oh, you're not really Indian. So it's like, it's something that just like she constantly thinks about. And then when it comes to like South Asian events, um, such as like the Eid Diwali party, I remember having this in my school, but they were like, but you're not really Indian. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, I don't know what I am. So I remember checking off other all on um, all these choices. And then I learned two years ago, we're supposed to be checking off Asian. So earlier this year, um, I was administering the COVID-19 vaccines. And I realized a lot of adults who are Indo-Caribbean would check off other or prefer not to answer. So it's just, it's, there's something amiss. There's like our culture. There's just, there's not that connection there that we're Asian. So yeah. it's an interesting thing to this day. Yeah, and Chris says I put other and put Guyanese, and and yeah, it's it's really interesting in in these census or government developed surveys, and and what's quite interesting is that these census they dictate resources for the community. They are meant to be used to represent the people living in the community, and I think that's where we do a lot of this and misjust the misjustice by not accurately representing the demographics. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Um, right now I'm just chilling. <laughs> As of right now, yeah, I'm looking at grad schools. That's about it right now. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so Tiara, Tiara is the curator of Two Times Removed. Tiara, thank you so, so, so much for bringing you <laughs> to life. We cannot thank you enough. Um, there's so many girls that picked up this book for the first time and was like, wow, like I am seen, I am heard, and I am understood. And it's in part because you had this dream. <laughs> thank you thank you guys honestly none of this could have happened without any of you and like all the other contributors the artists creating the cover like I can't say it enough and I say it like every chance I get because it's literally like it was like it was like my vision but I needed like I literally needed all of you guys to make it happen and I just like I really appreciate everyone for just like like trusting me we haven't even like met in person and you guys just like literally trusted like my vision and let me like do my thing and i'm just like i'm super super grateful for that 
No, we, we thank you. And it was an honor, really. And I'm going to read your bio. So Tiara J. Chokan is the book blogger, is a book, book, book blogger, writer and editor, born and raised in Toronto. Her love of literature led her to start blogging and sharing her reads, particularly those by BIPOC authors. Through her blogging, Tiara has had the opportunity to review books from HarperCollins, Penguin Random House, and ZG Stories. Tara's Indo-Caribbean heritage is extremely important to her, and she strives to create representation for her community. Uh, her, writer is uh, her writing is focused on exploring the Indo-Caribbean di diaspora, its history, and the culture, as well as community uh, features. Tara is the editor-in-chief at the Brown Girl Diary, another amazing um, representation of... Indo-Caribbean culture, and the marketing coordinator of Diaspora Dialogues. She is a regular contributor for the Brown Girl Diary, Brown Girl Diary now, and <laughs> Caribbean Collection Magazine. Tara is also working towards a certificate in creative writing from University of Toronto. Two times removed, an anthology of Indo-Caribbean fiction is her first book. What a great first book. So Tara wrote uh, Dig, a, Dig a Little Deeper, and so, Tiara, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your story? Definitely. So, um, in Dig a Little Deeper, I really try to capture, like, my own personal journey with my identity and and learning more about my family and, like, family history and, and things like that. And it was very, like, very much, <laughs> like, 70% based on... The, like the journey that I went through, which was, you know, late nights sitting there on my laptop, Googling, like all just Googling anything, like literally anything that was Indo-Caribbean related. I like I was literally sitting there reading like papers, like people's, you know, school papers that were like on the Internet and dissertations. And I, I don't even know, like there was so many documents and stuff that I found. And I was just combing through like everything. I was looking at like photos and just articles, just whatever, like honestly, anything, anything that I could find. And in the story, it starts off where my character is doing exactly that. And she's, you know, a young woman in her early 20s, same way I was like, two, <laughs> like two years, two, three years ago, when like, I first, you know, started this journey, I was like, I had just turned 23. And now I just turned 25. So it's been like two years. Um, and it, it's kind of just being in that exact same place. And then her, her dad notices that she's up late, and then they kind of end up engaging in like, a conversation and later her mom comes in and she's getting all this information about like her parents life um back home and and their experience coming to Canada because those and those are um very much like conversations that I have with my parents all the time because I um I'm Trinidadian and Guyanese so I get kind of like a mix and although like you know they're similar but there's still differences so I get a mix of like stories from my parents because you know my mom grew up in the city so she had a very different um experience growing up uh you know in Trinidad versus my dad who grew up in Guyana in like the countryside like serious like rural countryside and you know for him coming to Canada was like a huge shock because all this like city and everything and like he lived downtown when he first came here so it was like a huge shock comparison in comparison to like being like a little kid running around barefoot and there's like you know animals from like around the house you know what I mean like the animals you keep and stuff getting like fresh cow milk and whatever he talks about whereas yeah like my mom was in the city and she had a very different experience so as much as like it was still a shock for both of my parents um it was a bit maybe less of a shock for her in terms of like the city life just because she was like used to that already but those are just kind of the the stories and experiences that are covered in the story um and I when I wrote it, I also wanted to kind of promote the fact that, like, we need, we should be having these conversations with our parents. You know what I mean? Um, like, they're they're just they're really important. And one day, say, you know, they won't be here. Our grandparents won't be here. One day, we won't be here. So it's going to be important for us to do the same thing. Like, when you know, if we if anyone already has kids or if you know down the line when you do have kids it's going to be equally as important and those were just all the different elements that I kind of had in mind when I was putting together the story mm, and yeah it was such a wonderful story and I just want to underscore exactly what you just said is that even you know our, our parents came here and eventually we do have to think about preserving and how we save what we know about Indo-Caribbean identity as two times removed as 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 we get as we go on and have children and so we'll talk a little bit more 
uh, about that. And Tiara, what I love about your story too, I think it's really, it was really an inspiration for anyone really who read the story to, to actually dig a little deeper into their ancestry because some of us are not asking those questions yet to our, um, to our parents. And if there's anyone in the comments that wants to share anything about you know, your process and if you're asking your parents about where they're from, what boats they're coming from and these types of things, I, like, it seems like we're so busy in our everyday lives just trying to you know, get a job, right? These things don't seem to mean a lot. But as we get older, it means it's like when you're trying to look for yourself and find yourself, these are pieces of us that get lost, right? And so it was really a great inspiration for all of us to consider, you know, digging a little deeper, as you said. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I'll reintroduce the topic of, you know, talking a little bit more about Corella and, and it being like this story, some, this uh, symbolic representation for me as I sort of was reconciling my, um, my identity and some of these Corellas, as I call them, were things that I sort of just put down. And I was like, I, like, I can't do this. It's part of the culture. We'll talk about culture. It's part of our identity. But personally, I can't do this. Uh, Savita, you have a beautiful story in Blooming Through Adversity. Uh, if, um, uh, if Tiffany's on here, the shout out to Tiffany. That explores a really great one. And I'm wondering if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about that, Corella. <laughs> Oh, okay, the pressure to get married is a real one. I, you know what it is? You know, our parents, they got married at like 14, 13. That's like the normal for them. So for me to be 28 years old and single, it's like mind blowing to them. And it's not just that, you know, I kind of realized like gender based violence, it's such, it's such a norm in our society. If you know, they would say, oh, it's like, what do they call it? Like love bites or something? Like if, you know, a man and a woman, they're man and wife and they get into an argument and the man hits his wife, it's kind of the norm on the in the culture. And it's just not something I can get behind. And it's not just that. It's all of these little things. It's just, I feel like it's like the women also uphold certain standards as well. Like if a woman decides to leave her husband it's considered taboo it's not it's not like a really good i don't know it's the norm to stay to preserve your family life to have a child you know, to have a child come up with two parents no matter how dysfunctional the house is so it's not something i personally can get behind and that would be my cryla mm -hmm. domestic violence abuse is just not something i feel it's something that we need to talk about gender-based violence um i believe when andrea brought um and i believe this was in trinidad right so that was the first time i saw the country get together and said this is not okay we have to do something about this and it wasn't just andrea brought i believe it was ashanti riley mm -hmm. she was also another girl who also her life was lost so it is something that we do need to talk about in the community as well as you know, not put these the pressure on when they get married before they're ready as well. Because a lot of us have dreams to accomplish, you know, and sometimes our education might take a while to complete and we want to focus more on that as well, on our career aspirations. But yeah, gender-based violence is a huge thing in our community that we do need to tackle. Mm -hmm. And there are a few stories in Two Times Removed that speak to this. And Corella, and, and what's interesting, I'll share I'll share now is that Carla was supposed to be this this story just premised on gender-based violence and for whatever reason my, I read it to my sister and she was like you I, I think that you have a great way of writing about love and resilience and so incorporate that into your story and so it morphed into this more of like a love and resilience story more than it was premised on you know, this particular subject of gender-based violence, it also covers um, alcoholism, which probably goes uh, hand in hand. And so for me personally, that's a huge Corella. And I just want to set the record straight that the main character, um, my dad is, is not he's not an alcoholic and he he doesn't beat my dad <laughs> I mean my mom so I just want to everybody was messaging me and was like I didn't know you. this these are all fiction stories <laughs> and so I feel like I need to just clear my dad's name um but the fact of the matter is 
as you were saying, Savita, this is a huge problem in the, in the community. And as you were also saying, not a lot of people talk about it. Um, a lot of people don't speak about um, the um, relation between uh, alcoholism and how this promotes this sort of culture and these habits. Um, so I'm with you on that. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Tiara, how about you? Are, are, what, are your, what are some of your Karelas in, in our, in our uh, culture? Um, I think for me, I kind of, I, I guess in, in a sense, it's, it's a bit similar, but not maybe specific to, to, um, gender-based violence, but just the overall experience, I think of, of Indo-Caribbean women, um, has been probably one of the, the most, just one of the things that really got me kind of from the beginning, from the time I, I, Red Coolie Woman, which was kind of like the the thing that like set set off this whole journey for me in general, because that was just like the f most knowledge I had gotten in one place. Um, but even from that book, you know, you read about all the the different experiences that women had, and it it was. It's, it's in so many different forms. It's not necessarily just the physical violence, but it was like women who, who chose to, to get on, on the ships that, you know, um, and, and come over to the Caribbean. They, a lot of them were already facing a lot of really messed up situations uh, back, back in India. You know, there were, there were women who, who might have, you know, some of our ancestors might have been prostitutes because they were, you know, abandoned by husbands or families, things like that. Some of them might have been fleeing already, like, you know, a bad relationships. And because, you know, the whole thing with divorce is just not really being an option. They just kind of had to stick it out. But they looked at this as a way to flee, you know, even onto the ship. And then when you get back onto the ships, there was a whole nother ball game there because a lot of women traveled alone. Some were pregnant and alone. So you can even imagine how scary that might have been, as well as like dealing with like sexual abuse from these like white men who were on the ships, the, you know, the different staff that was on there. And then you factor in getting to, you know, plantations, coming to a new land. And then, you know, we know kind of how it went from there with the types of things that women face. And then even past uh, the indenture period, if we go back to, you know, our great grandparents and grandparents and and their stories, like, for example, um, like Secrets We Kept, which is a, a book by Crystal Sattel that is literally like amazing, but so heartbreaking because it's, you know, her telling her grandmother and, and, and her mother's story and her grandmother was you know just terribly abused by her grandfather and those are things that were only happening like 60 years ago 50 years ago type you know so it's it's just things like that that I really I find I reflect on a lot because it was like kind of what when I wrote in the introduction that it was because all of these people all of our ancestors that the book got to exist is really that because all these women who came before us they kind of literally and proverbially like took the beating so um, uh, like a lot of us didn't have to you know what I mean and it's just it's literally because of them that we don't you know we like we don't necessarily have to face these things we have you know more freedom we have more choices we're not necessarily if we're in bad situations we're not necessarily bound to them and there's just there's more available to us we're not necessarily bound to the situations that our ancestors were um so it's just it's just it's things like that getting to share these stories and whether they're you know um fictional stories or you know like tiffany's book was based off literally like people's actual stories not necessarily fictionalized but we get to tell these stories now freely there's there's nothing there's nothing stopping us really you know what i mean and those are opportunities that people before us didn't have and we have them and we get to exercise them so it's just it, it's kind of crazy to think because it's it's really because of them and then aside from because of them it's like we're like we we get we have to do this for ourselves and for them <laughs> if all if like hopefully if that makes sense but it's just um it, I think it's just that it's just women as a whole the whole experience the whole transition from even to 150 years ago even 100 years ago you know, to to right now being in 2021 as Indo-Caribbean women, it's uh, just like an astronomically different experience. And 
you know, we have like, we have no one to thank, but everyone who came came before us. And it's it's really our job to like do them the justice that they weren't able to do. Mm -hmm. And I think what you brought up was interesting, because there are so many aspects of how our, our ancestry and our c culture came about that are actually big Karailas. For example, a lot of how people were brought here were premised upon this dream, right? This dream of riches and gold, which net wasn't the wasn't really what happened, right? They were still they were um, committed to this servitude under really, really damaging circumstances. And so that probably promoted some of the um, issues that we're seeing the intergenerational traumas that we're seeing um, as as we're getting older as well and we're trying to process and I just want to hold space for some of those women who are still going through some of these things. Um, it feels as though I, I, I do want to acknowledge that there are people um, in our in our life now and in our in this day and age that are suffering from domestic violence and feel like they're trapped in this place. Um, so I just want to hold space for that. Um, so, uh, Saira, I was wondering, you brought up this interesting, before you, you brought up this interesting idea of being called a coconut. And I feel like I can completely relate to that. One of the things that um, I was really obvious, like right from the beginning was like, I just dress differently. Like I just have like this different style that I have. And so it was always this thing like, oh, you're, you're dressing like a white girl. I'm like, okay, so, so hold on, though. No. Tell me, tell me how I'm supposed to dress, because you're not dressing me. Like, who, who's, whose standard is this? So just tell me. So I completely relate to this coconut thing. So tell us a little bit more about your experience. I think for me, it's like, wow, like you sound so proper. I was born, like, <laughs> um, or like. Era, like that's such an exotic name um where's it from um oh my god can i just say i literally i'm not gonna i'm not gonna curse on this thing but i seriously hate when people say the exotic thing <laughs> uh, like i can't even tell you guys enough i hate that with a burning passion um keish you've never heard the term coconut before yeah, Keisha just said that. Yeah, it's it's a term that that's that's like because the coconut's brown on the inside and uh, outside and white on the inside, and I so I've heard it, and unfortunately, um, that's a thing. And yeah, Growing you know up, what's in, you know uh, what's interesting about this, Sarah? And tell me if you if you relate to this. It's like you know, it's our own people saying this, right? So. I want I wanted to know about you uh, with regards to or just every, everyone in general around how as a culture as self identified Indo Caribbean people how we perpetuate some of these and possibly what we can do about it. Well, like I know for me, like growing up, like my mom was always like just just blend in, you know, just mm -hmm. you know, like it was almost like she just like really wanted to assimilate to white culture. Like as as a young person, assimilation, white culture that wasn't in my head now is learning about um, the term like model minority and all of that stuff. Um, I ha like I understand her her way of thinking. Like oh, we're in Canada, we have to be be like Canadians. Um, so I think it's like it stems from my upbringing. Um, versus my dad my dad was always like just a custom rasa <laughs> like, <laughs> like you don't take no problem no shit from no one excuse me like, <laughs> and, and so that like i i was like very, like cussing managers up at mcdonald's because my daddy told me so <laughs> uh, and my mom would be like why like i remember i wrote an article um like uh, like a, an Indo-Caribbean practitioner perspective in my field of child and youth care. And my mom's perspective was like, oh gosh, you're gonna upset all them white people. Uh, you're not gonna get a good job. And I'm like, mom, relax, the white people love me. Um, <laughs> and I show up my dad in the article and he's like, yes, bless him. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like here's my autograph. But, um, but I feel like it stemmed from there. Like you blending in, like just blend. So I tried, like you know, I got the colored contacts. I try, I dyed my hair blonde. Like you know, I really tried, and I struggled because I didn't fit. 
I didn't fit in. My skin, my skin did not fit in with those pretty blue eyes, blonde hair, white girls growing up. And so I just tried to change my my way of being. And I remember, I remember coming to Ryerson and going to Wiza and Akisha was the, f I met you at the table when I signed up and I met Akisha and um, I like, I, the, this memory stays with me. And she's like, oh, like, hi, I'm Akisha. Like, come, like, do you want some doubles? Do you want some chlorine? I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, you guys eat this food? <laughs> like, I you thought I only ate it. Like my home, like my dad, my dad, like this is food that like my dad brings me. Um, I didn't, I didn't think I could eat it like outside with other people around. Like you have to eat that with your hands. Like what are the people going to say? <laughs> and so she took me out a plate of food and I was like, okay. But um, yeah, like I feel like I really struggle with that. Even like now I struggle with the term coconut. Um and I really try and integrate my my identity into my workplace. And so I have a big Trini and Guyanese flag in my office at Ryerson. So when my students come in, they're like, you're Caribbean? You're in this job? Wow. <laughs> so, so I think it's a daily struggle for me. Yeah. And I, one of the things is I just want to honor Akisha on here for a second. All of the other... Um, ex-University Ryerson alumni who really set the stage for us who came into Ryerson and had the opportunity to socially meet and see ourselves in university and see ourselves represented and eat Polari with our hands. So big up them, big up to them. Eat with and, <laughs> and going back to the assimilation, I think this is one of the things that I think we, um, in addition to, uh, there's probably a middle between like assimilating and cussing off the people then. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's some great resources there. <laughs> well, I'm so, so thank God. Like, so I worked for, I used to work in a school, in a high school, and like I had Caribbean students. I was like the one person of color, only like CYC in the, in the board or in that school. And I was like, you know, talking to my students, like, get your backside to class, whatever. And I had, I had a teacher who was like my superior, um, tell me, you know, it's very inappropriate for you to be speaking like that. And I was like, excuse, speaking like what? Um, and she's like, in that tone, you were just speaking to students too. And I was like, um, so you're telling me it's inappropriate for the Italian teachers to speak Italian to teacher to students then? And she's like, oh, oh, like, and I was like, don't tell me how to speak to my students of color, please. Like, just, just don't. Um, but like, I've been told like, oh, you can't speak like that here. Speak like what? Like, if I'm seeing another Indo-Caribbean person, I'm gonna be like, hey, like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna feel comfortable. But that doesn't always work out because I met one girl that was like, sorry, I don't. No, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that's just, yeah, that's just another reason why I guess, you know, we have to, we have to big up ourselves and big up our community as well as there's, there's I, I have come across people who don't, um, who don't uh, self-identify as Caribbean, mm -hmm. no Caribbean. So um, that's a different topic though. Um, <laughs> Savita, I'm wondering from you because one of one of my Karelas was, and, and you have this premise around how women should show up in the world and all of the ways that um, we have sort of made ourselves small and we've sort of, as women, made ourselves small and how we can reclaim sort of that womanness and that unapologetic way of going for our dreams and striving. And one of the things, Sarah, you almost mentioned too, was one of my Karelas was like, you know, this, this, thing around you have to like Indo-Caribbean women are like loud and so you gotta like dim yourself a little bit and it's like who who wrote this rule book because this rule book don't go on with me this is a terrible rule book and so Savita I'm wondering from you like in terms of being a woman how you show up in this world like what are some of the things specifically that you've had to deal with well for me you know what I found with being Caribbean I found that a lot of people tend to hypersexualize us and it's really weird because we're exotic. So when I'm talking to like a South Asian man, and if they're not seeing us as Indian, they're just like, oh, but I really just wanted to talk to you. And they kind of 
treat you differently than how they would treat a woman who they would consider Indian. And it was something I kind of noticed over time. And I remembered I had this friend in high school and he was Bengali and he was dating my friend and they broke up and he goes, oh yeah, but there was no way I would introduce her to my parents because she's Guyanese. And I was like, hello, who am I? Like, are we friends? And I didn't understand what that meant at all. And it's something I found over time that it is an interesting thing. So that's one thing with being a Caribbean woman. Um, I also found that we tend to box ourselves in and we don't have to do that. We don't have to stick to a specific role. We can, there are so many things in this life that we can do and so many things we can be. And we don't have to lay, stick ourselves in one thing. If you have many passions, just go for it. There's no need to like say, oh, this is the one thing I'm good at. I'm going to stick to this. Or, you know, if you want to be a mom, there's nothing wrong with that. Be the best mom you can be. But it is not, you know, our community tends to, we're pretty judgmental in certain ways we think a woman should be you know the perfect wife the perfect mother and sometimes it's not easy and I commend those women like I don't know how they do it like and then to have a full-time job come home it is just not easy at all mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah and I think one of the things is like you know as women I think we need to show up in all of our indo caribbean however we want to show up as if that's being the, mo the best mom you can be whether that's being an entrepreneur whether that's being a doctor um so forth and so on so I don't want us to get cut off so I'm gonna switch up the topics but um uh Tara I wanted to know anything else for you like as as far as Karylas go anything that you're like oh this like doesn't feel right to me as an Indo-Caribbean woman um anything you want to share to kind of um, wrap up that sort of part of the conversation um I think just in general like I I really agreed with like Syrah's experience especially when I was younger like high school was high school was a trip honestly <laughs> I like I did the whole thing where like I straightened my hair every day probably from like grade seven straight to like grade 12 and by the end of it, it was just like, you, like it was just gross, you know, <laughs> but it was just stuff like that. Like, just like not even just trying to kind of like fit. I like I grew up in a really like white neighborhood, my school, same thing and everything. And no, like nobody, re nobody really knew what Indo-Caribbean was either. So it was like always trying to explain to people like, well, I'm Caribbean. And it's like, oh, but you look Indian. And it was it was the most irritating thing in a sense because there was people who I grew up with from like elementary school even to like middle school high school and they would still be like yeah but you know you still look Indian and it's like okay well you've known me for like 10 years at this point like we're still on that like really you know so those I think those were probably like the toughest years in in a sense for like identity for me probably since like, from like I think like grade three four is when people start getting like conscious of each other like where you're not just like oh yeah like we're kids we're just playing and but when you really start to get like conscious of one another like when people start asking like where are you from what do your parents do where do you live you know what I mean do you live in a house or, or an apartment like just things like that because prior in your in your younger years like no one asks those questions but then when you get like a bit into that like big kid stage then everyone becomes conscious of like these things and like the fact that like oh everyone looks different so we're from different places and things like that and probably from then on till high school it was literally just like an ongoing explaining explaining thing for me until I got to college and like like all my friends you know were pretty much like afro-caribbean but i never had to explain anything to them because they just they could just look at me and tell they were just like okay hey, you're either trini or guy and you just tell me which one and i'm like i'm both so you're right <laughs> like regard you're right you're, re you're like you're right regardless <laughs> but it was from college onwards that things got easier in terms of like identity but anything prior to that was honestly honestly a mess <laughs> for me because i just like I never fit anywhere and especially like I, I, could, I didn't even try to do the thing where like you try to like hang out with like the South Asian kids like the South Asian South Asian kids because like you know brown on that I didn't even bother because it was like it was a fail from the jump honestly <laughs> it, it didn't work for me it didn't work for me from like so early on and I was just like okay well that 
never mind never mind it's not gonna work and I, like I just knew it was just it was just really I don't know like at least for my experience I know like not everyone has that experience but mine was just like okay yeah I'm not even gonna bother though like the like you guys are gonna try to test me I don't have any answers for you I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> never seen that movie like I like I can't I just could like I couldn't do it and I couldn't even try to like try to be who I wasn't and that kind of made it even more awkward because like it was like trying to like mask you know what I mean like trying to mask your identity but like it keeps popping out so it actually just ends up being like a bigger awkward mess because yeah. <laughs> it's like you're not even you're like trying to like half not be who you are but then like you kind of can't like fully hide it so yeah that that was just that was like my experience when it came to that but all of those like all of those really like brought up those memories for me and I'm just like oh yeah what a mess <laughs> yeah and I think one of the things is that if we aren't around Indo-Caribbean people I think some of us will will and, and some people I think do really identify with the South Asian uh, heritage and the culture and and some people don't I think it's to each their own and Chris says a lot of people from India treat people from the Caribbean different like we're an outcast and that is facts stephanie says anyone had those old indian aunties speak hindi or urdu do you think you were uh, urdu to you thinking you were indian trying to explain you're not indian is so <laughs> annoying amen steph um chris says the funniest is when you're working uh and people think you're from india and your co-workers tell others oh no he is from in he is not from india but from guyana in the caribbean Yes, yes. I think that's that's probably one of the biggest um, Karelas as well is like being looped into that category of South Asian. And again, lots of people have um, claimed that and so uh, honor that as well. Okay, um, on the bus all the time, Akisha says, and then they'd shake their head like mom failed teaching me the language. Yep, yep, yep. And for me personally, I, I work primarily in the corporate space and there's not even like brown people, right? So it's just, <laughs> it's just like white men. And so, you know, having to explain and, and, uh, and, you know, try to, sometimes you just skip the whole thing. You're just like, ah, I'm not even gonna bother unless it's like, it's, it's something that I want, I feel like doing in the, in the moment. But, okay, so uh, another Karela, I think I just wanna shout out, we don't need to go uh, into it too much, but um, well, I did want to say and acknowledge that one of my biggest Karelas is how we treat the LGBTQ plus plus community in our culture. I can't stand that. And one last one was around this. Um, I don't know if you, you guys and we don't need to go too much into it, but it's like this um, competitive nature in in families and in Indo Caribbean families is like I for me personally, I grew up sort of like you know, watch so-and-so and what they have and look, why can't you do this? Or this so-and-so is doing this. How come you're not doing this? And it's like, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. And so I, I make it a, a, a point because um, we, you know, my sisters are procreating and having kids and stuff. So that's a big <laughs> one that for me is like such a pain in my backside. So um, <laughs> Switching gears, so um, part of Karela as well, the story was this beautiful representation of passing things down and passing down the recipe book and all these recipes, again, as representation of our identity and the different parts of our identity that are beautiful and that the main character, Felicia, just loves and adores. So um, how, what do you guys think about this? Like, what is what are like parts of being Indo-Caribbean that you're like, I love it. I can't like I need to figure out how to preserve this. Like, I got to do this. Anyone can go ahead. I feel like I mentioned before food, like food is very, very important and big. Um, so I got married relatively young. I was 23 when I married my husband. Um, love that man. <laughs> He's a keeper, <laughs> a really good partner. Um, but I, I didn't know how to cook and, um, like I wanted to learn. I probably only knew how to make mac and cheese. Um, so I, I, I was determined to learn how to cook when I got married. And and then I, I got pregnant and I had my son and I was determined for him to 
to love the food that I love, my doll and rice, my curry chicken, uh, my stew chicken, my bus of shah roti. And thank God I have a mother-in-law that loves to cook roti because this girl can make roti for shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I feel like food is very big. And I also like growing up, like we used to go back home. Like back home is like Guyana and Trinidad. Like that's how... Um, like, you know, you would go on those yearly trips or every couple years you're going to Guyana or you're going to Trinidad. Um, I want, like, I want to expose him to that. Despite not being born there, I mm. still have tons of family there. And he has tons of cousins there. So I want, I want him to be exposed to going back home <laughs> um, to visit family. Um, now, I don't, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, he was, supposed to go, he was supposed to go back home last year and that didn't, didn't get to happen. So, um, so I feel like food is really big and also staying connected to the country. Like, I don't want him to grow up saying, oh yeah, my, my mom's from here, but like I was born here. Like I, like, I want him to like feel rooted and connected. Like I want him to have that connectedness. I took my dad's ashes back home. I want him to go and visit his Nana and see where his Nana was raised and grew up in a village, et cetera, et cetera. So see where his nanny was raised and his Aja and Aji. So it's, it's that. Like that's what I'm, I'm really worried about is like him losing that, like that we have. The, like the culture that we have and keep um yeah so that's that's my worry food and like preserving essentially the culture and connectedness to to the country awesome and good on you Sarah for for saying that to yourself like I want to take my child back home I want the, him to be immersed and you know what's interesting I think uh, what I think anyway is that it doesn't matter if they weren't born there when they go back I think that they feel home like naturally will feel home and so good on you for that and in terms of food like do you regularly cook um you know caribbean food um is it do you have recipe book how are you preserving food wise food um so i write down recipes in a book i don't like maybe it'll get passed down to him it has like <laughs> watermarks everywhere <laughs> um and then uh my cousin had bought me that naparima um cookbook uh, school girls cookbook yeah so I have that too with like sticky notes everywhere um and like he oh Akisha just m made me remember music so he's a big soca head <laughs> so because of mama like boy learned how to whine when he was like two <laughs> um but I didn't expose him to like the the Indian side so he doesn't really like like Indian music like mm. the Indian Indian music he likes chutney but like not into the Indian music but um but yeah I'll so have that a phase I think every ch child has a phase I don't know if you guys had like a Bollywood wood phase but like you just listen to Bollywood music <laughs> <laughs> he plays <laughs> how <laughs> He plays tabla so like we want him to be immersed in his culture some way so he's a tabla player um but but yeah so there's my my uh, my cookbook and or my my recipe book that i don't know what it'll be in 20 years <laughs> and then um i like to album so like i album all of our trips so he'll get that when we, when we go visit trinidad and guyana as well Amazing, amazing. Savita, how about you? What are you? And I hopefully I don't know how much time we have, but um, yeah, how about you? What are your? How are you preserving? What do you want to preserve? Definitely the food and the music. And I don't know what it is our vibe, but we just like have this high vibe where we're loud and our community is always close, and we're always we're just like giving people in general. So I <sighs> continue that. Yeah, and just going, like, underlining what you just said, I think Indo-Caribbean people, especially when you go back home, we're such a close-knit people, like, take off the gossip for a sec, but, like, under, <laughs> like, the intent underneath is, like, they're, they're really there for their people, you know, cook for people, give food to people, help people, um, and I think we're just such a compassionate type of people, right, and so holding on to that and especially being here in, in Canada, you can you can easily lose that it being such an individualistic country in the West. So very great point. How about you, uh, 
Tiara, how about, um, what are you preserving? What do you hope to preserve? What do you love? <clears throat> Um, I think I'm definitely gonna just like third on the on the food for sure, just because I I mean, I, I grew up eating like, you know, just all my my different home foods. There's certain things that like, I, I'm not like a fan of. But like, aside from that, I still, you know what I mean? I still grew up eating it. I straight up don't know how to cook like pretty much anything right now. But <laughs> but you know just because I've always been lucky to have like my like my parents and my grandparents just like forever being like an endless source of like food um but like honestly nothing is more pristine than like roti with anything honestly just literally anything even if it's so simple it's just like like curry alu or something like that it's just it's pristine like I don't know it's just so pristine so food is a huge one for me it's like the day I have a kid, they're not going to escape that one. You're going to, you're going to learn to love it. And I'm pretty sure they are just going to love it off the fact that it's, it's awesome. But music is another one. I'll second that. Um, but I think a huge one for me too, is just like continuing like the family history. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like, I'm in, I've been in a stage as well where I'm really trying to like ask around and like figure out all the like family stories, all the history. I, um, like I, I've never really known much about uh my like on my dad's side. There's still there's a lot of mysteries on there because I, I like I don't know my um my grandfather at all, and my dad doesn't know him really at all either. Uh, so I've been trying to track him down, <laughs> and that's been that's been fun. It's already spanned across like me talking to people from like four different countries at this point, trying to find one old Guyanese man, and I've had somewhat of luck but still still working on it (laughs) um but I think all that stuff is really important and I'm definitely going to want to pass down like the stories and be like you know like this is this is what I know this is this is what we're you know what regions our ancestors came from things like that I definitely want to like go back and do the whole um the whole archive thing and try to see who and what if possible I can trace because I think that stuff is like super super valuable um and again like those those things are already so old so you never know like how long or how and what so I definitely want to do it sooner than later just to to have that information um and have that available my my growing book collection like my Indo-Caribbean book collection specifically yeah, that one's going to be passed down for sure. I'm I'm definitely going to be that parent that's going to be like, take this, sit down and read for an hour. I don't want you getting up. Just read it. I don't like I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if you get bored on the first page, go to the third page. Look, it's fine. <laughs> just just read it. Just read it. Because it might seem like boring or weird at first when like you're a kid. But later on, when you're, you know, when you're older, you're on God going to appreciate it. So that's going to be a huge, huge one for me as well. Awesome. And I think one of the things too is like music, of course, food, of course, some of the compassionate nature of our culture and some of the other aspects around, you know, celebrating and flowing with life. We do have this like freeness in us that I think I, I would love to preserve and not get my, you know, my kids or my, my nieces and nephews too wrapped up into. Um, so all of those things I think are really important for us to to share. And when we really think about it is we're going to be ancestors. So, how, yeah, I know. My niece <laughs> called me a boomer yesterday. I was like, sorry, what? I'm, I'm not a boomer. Babe, I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I'm a not even girl. close. <laughs> So we're all we all should you know i hope that we all try to take the time to see how we can integrate um our indo caribbeanness into our lives today and i think for me one of the things i started doing was i started i cook every day and i cook indo caribbean food every day so that's one of the ways that when i was starting that it was like it kept me so rooted in my culture i felt like all like i felt like I know exactly how much salt to put in. I know exactly how much car- curry to put in. Like, I'm at that stage when I hear, like, my ancestors is telling me what to do, you know? And so <laughs> it's such a good place to be in. It's such a nice place to feel that you're in. And so I think if we can pass that on to, you know, the future generations, I think that would be wonderful. Um, so I have a quick question before I have the final question. And the, the quick question is, do you or do you not like Karayla? I love Kryla. 
No, no, that's one of the things that are, that's on my list. That honestly, I won't eat it. <laughs> that, yeah, that's straight, straight. I won't eat it. Tell us if you like Corel or not. Tell us if there's anything else that you really want to make sure you preserve for your children, or if you have any tips on how you're preserving that. If you have children already, we would love to hear, and I can definitely read them out. Um, and so the final question, and one last um, sort of overall arching theme that's part of, I guess, my Corel, I guess, which is like this, because um, I, I went through a phase where I was sort of like reclaiming uh, Indo-Caribbean identity and so I want to know from from you guys if anybody's listening and for whatever good reason um, they're struggling with claiming Indo-Caribbean identity what would you say to them any words of wisdom I know that our history a lot of it's gone like the complete total erasure but you know what it is there is more we're finding out more things now than ever. You know, when I was a kid, I couldn't make the connection to, as to how I was Indian. You know, there's, we knew somewhere along the line, someone there came over, but that was it. Like that's, my parents don't even know their own parents. They don't even know their own name, like their mother and father's names. So it's really sad to know, okay, but I can't make the connection. Like how am I Indian? And you know, it's funny. I told my friend the other day, I didn't even know the term Indo-Caribbean existed until like two years ago. So I've just been going around telling people, oh, I'm Guyanese. I'm from Queens. Same. Killing. <laughs> it makes sense to me. I didn't see the connection to my Indian side for a really long time. But I knew like deep down I was Indian because, you know, I look like this. My name is Savita Prasad. Like, like there are certain things like, okay, yeah, well, there is something there, but I just don't know how it connects. And it took me a long time to figure it out. And now, like, there's a lot of good resources out there. You know, the Cut Loss podcast, they do amazing work. So shout out to them because I wouldn't even know half the things if it wasn't for them. So congratulations there. But just, like, go back to your history and you, you will find a sense of purpose there. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. It's learning the history. Part of reclaiming or proclaiming history, I think, is a lot of um, can be can be rooted in just exploration around where we came from, what our story is. And one of the things that Vinay said, Kala said, was uh, preserving language and dialect. Amazing. That's such an important um, thing. And it's like, even if it's, you know, some of the um, Hindi words or just our broken English, too, right? Like, share these words and how what they mean and what we use them for like pugly and whatever else that we use to to tell people um one appster said we read these children's storybooks about granny jj's that's an amazing tip it's reading stories to our children that are from our culture that's amazing but yeah how about you tiara what would you say like somebody's like I don't feel like I don't feel like I belong in this group. I don't really feel it. What would you say? Um, I think I would say that you have to you kind of have to start like the process for yourself. And it's totally OK to feel kind of like out of place or feel like you're not you know what I mean you're not fully like sure where you fit and I feel like I can definitely relate to that because I like I didn't grow up with other Indo-Caribbean people not honestly probably until like like last year when I got to become part of Brown Girl Diary it was really when I got really got to be around other Indo-Caribbean people and then like on my Instagram because I started like showing Indo-Caribbean books and I think like honestly I feel like majority of my following is Indo-Caribbean people and it's just it's kind of mind-blowing to me now because I spent so long like not having Indo-Caribbean people um, around me aside from my family so I definitely feel like even sometimes like I like I understand the feeling because sometimes I feel like oh gosh like I'm I don't know like I feel kind of like I didn't go to so-and-so type of party and I didn't like grow up going to this and that I've never even been to a prayers or nothing like can somebody invite me to their prayers please I, like I'm not, I haven't been really exposed to those things because one like my family didn't really do those things certain things and you know whatever and I didn't have like other people around me or like friends to be like okay well you go by so and so and this and this and I don't have a huge family on top of that either I was literally like the only kid in my family for the longest time like no cousins no brothers and sisters so it was just 
like me mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was also a thing too there was no other like no other like kids around me um so it's just like me and like all the adults but yeah my point being is just like it's okay to feel like to feel you know out of place or feel like you don't fit but I think once you you start the journey and actually just kind of like what Sabita was saying about like the history and things like that when you start to tap in and you start to learn and you start to just like connect with who's around you that was really a huge one for me too it's just like okay well I have my family so I'm gonna tap into my family and then you realize you're probably more Indo-Caribbean than you think than you think you are you just have to like really tap into it and when I did tap into it then I started remembering I was like oh yeah no like we used to play I mean still do but like I remember like being at my grandma's house when I was a kid and it was like New Year's parties. And even though there was like other music playing, there were little like segments where we were doing the chutney and everything like that. And I love me some chutney. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> like I'm tapped in, you know? So it's just, it, it, it takes time, but I think it's just like that. That's the biggest thing I kind of say. That's a, it was the longest ramble ever, but just like ta- literally just tap in and just look at who's around you. Even if it's literally just your family, just, tap into them just literally tap into them and 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 figure out what what um figure out where like just where you where you fit what you identify with and stuff like that um because it like it takes time and it's not going to happen happen overnight Mm -hmm. and I think I think that's one of the things that I didn't really consider because I grew up with a large a large um, Indo-Caribbean family it's like that that you know, that little girl like you, Tiara, who's growing up with not a big family trying to figure out herself and like, thank goodness now for social media in this sense where you can meet people and you can bring people together. There's the Brown Gal Diary, there's Cutlass. And so um, hopefully I can imagine being at that age and having those resources kind of kind of would help would help in in some way right so one of the things for me that I think I will um I want to share around being Indo-Caribbean and anyone who's who's struggling um which I think is really important and it's if you self-identify with Indo-Caribbean culture doesn't matter what box someone has put you in or if you belong in this box or this thing that people want to put you in claim it you are Indo-Caribbean, you enjoy whatever it is that you enjoy, whatever it may be, be loud and proud about it because the fact of the matter is, I think we need, we need you. We need you in the, in the society, we need you in the culture, we need you to show up as your bold, different self so we can expand how we show up as Indo-Caribbean people. Um, sort of to break down some of these stereotypes that we have around what it looks, what it should look like to being Indo-Caribbean. Um, and I think we put people in a position when we create these boxes to, um, to opt out to opt out and say, you know what, I'm not Caribbean enough. I'm not Indo-Caribbean enough. And so to that, I say, you are Indo-Caribbean. You show up however you want to show up and claim it. And don't let anybody tell you that you're not Indo-Caribbean, you're not Guyanese, you're not Trini, whatever the case may be. And um, to be proud, to be proud because we need you. We need you as part of the culture to share um, who you are because there's some little girl that wants to see you in them you know there's somebody who wants to see themselves in you so um that's what i would say mm-hmm. and on that note i wanted to thank everybody up in the comments thank you so much we had such um great comments uh thank you so much for engaging Saira, savita tiara thank you so 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 very much for joining us um if there's anything uh, else you want to share please share um and then i'm going to share something to close off and then we'll head off Anything you wanted to say, last words, anything like that? I think, like, I wanted to just say, like, for me with, like, I have a lot of young people that I work with, like, students. And so I, like, I always tell them, like, start with history. Start with, you know, having conversations with your family. Start with, like, come talk to me anytime you want to talk. Like, we can always have a conversation. Um, And also follow Brown Gal Diary. Follow the... And cut last. (laughs) follow these pages like a cut last post like I've learned so much myself from them. um you know buy cool buy the book coolie woman or you can borrow my copy um I like I always try and encourage yeah now, now we have more literature two times and we have 
through adversity. So this is awesome that we are putting out more and more literature for young people to read. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's what I, I hope. Dear Divya, I hope to continue writing because I hope that that's my way of connecting to the younger generation. And Tiara is going to be my publisher. So <laughs> That. But thank you so much, Anna, for hosting this discussion. It's been awesome. Um, I'm really happy that you had asked us to join and be a part of it. And um, I can't wait to meet all of you beautiful people in person, you know, in like 2022 or 2023. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully sooner. Like, honestly, hopefully sooner. Oh, gosh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay so when i posted uh two times removed i posted this note and i'm just gonna we're gonna end off with this note okay um our generation has the potential to be the wildest dreams of the approximately two million souls transported across the ocean the approximately two million women who left india and created culture across the caribbean are dancing with us so heal nourish and live we are the gold our ancestors were promised Okay, so thank you all so much for joining us. Girls, thank you. Thank you so much. Hope to see thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Hey, how do I leave? <laughs>